is another longtime supporter of our chapter, um, and I have the privilege now of actually working with him. He is chairing our medical advisory board right now. Um, so he helps us put together great programs, and he's a wonderful resource for us to have. Um, and this topic, lupus and uh, memory problems, he actually came up with the idea because we get questions about it so many times, and I know the information he has will be very valuable to everyone. So, thank you, Don. So the man looks at his wife, and he says, my memory is so bad. She says, how bad is it? He says, how bad is what? <laughs> You've been there, haven't you? <laughs> Have you ever been sitting somewhere and staring off to space, and you're forgetting what you just did a few minutes ago, and you're going to do something, and you're, you forgot what you were about to do? Have you ever been talking to a friend, and you had that word on the tip of your tongue? It's a word that you've used many times in the past, and you just cannot remember what that word is. Have you been driving to the store, and then all at once you think, what, I, what was I just doing the last few minutes? What am I going to the store for? I, I, I know I was going to buy something, but I can't remember what that is. <coughs> we have a word for this. It's called lupus fog. It feels like you're in a fog, and it's hard to concentrate, and sometimes you just can't figure out what's going on, or you're having trouble with your memory. In those 30% of people who have lupus who also have fibromyalgia, we call it fibrofog. The medical term for this is cognitive dysfunction, an abnormality or a bad functioning uh, memory. In fact, if you want to Google uh, on the internet uh, information about memory problems in lupus, do a Google search for cognitive dysfunction and lupus. Cognitive dysfunction and memory problems are common in systemic lupus erythematosus. A 2010 study showed that 50% of our lupus patients have significant problems with their memory. But it's not just a problem with systemic lupus. It's also prevalent in other systemic autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Many of you are hit, sitting here today because you do have significant problems with your memory you're frustrated, and you just want some help. The good news is that there are things you can do to actually improve your memory. There's things that you can actually do to decrease the decline of your memory over time. The information I'm going to present is based upon medical research. It's based on scientific fact. And so take your thinking caps, put those thinking caps on, and start to concentrate. But if you don't get everything I'm talking about today, the handout we gave you is full of a lot of useful information and includes a lot more stuff than even what I'm going on over uh, for the next 45 minutes. So the things I'll cover for the next 45 minutes is number one, what causes lupus problems or what causes memory problems in lupus. And most importantly though, what you can do about those memory problems and we'll come up with an action plan on things that you can do to help out with your memory. So one question that people always ask when they have memory problems and they approach me in the clinic is, could I have Alzheimer's disease? That's a very scary thing to consider because when we have problems with memory, that's the first thing that oftentimes pops up. Alzheimer's disease is a very bad disease. It's a degenerative disease that does get worse over time. And it's unfortunately the sixth most common cause of death in the United States. The good news is that lupus fog does not turn into Alzheimer's disease. The good news is that even though Alzheimer's disease gets worse, lupus fog does not get worse. So that's the good news. And it's also another important thing to remember is that Alzheimer's disease is rare in people less than 60 years of age. So if you're less than 60, you really should not be thinking much about Alzheimer's disease. Has this ever happened to you? You're ready to get into the car and you're just looking for those keys. You can't remember where you put them and they're sitting right there in front of you on the table uh, in front of you. And this is a memory problem, but it's a very common problem, but it's very easy for us to wonder right away, could we possibly have Alzheimer's disease as the cause of that memory situation problem? There are some differences between what we see with lupus fog and what we see with Alzheimer's disease, and I'll go over some of those. Uh, it's very common with lupus fog to occasionally make bad decisions. But with Alzheimer's disease, 
bad decisions are made on a regular basis all the time, greatly interfering with the quality of life, and it does get worse and worse over time. The person with lupus fog may occasionally miss a monthly payment, but the person with Alzheimer's disease, they can't budget, they can't balance their budget at all. The person with lupus fog may forget the date. Oh, is today is today April the 30th or you know but but later on in the day you'll figure it out and you'll remember what the date is. The person with with Alzheimer's disease though, they totally lose track of dates and seasons and they just don't worry about remembering the date later on in the day. The so person with lupus fog sometimes forgets which word to use. It's on the tip of the tongue. But the person with Alzheimer's disease, they have great difficulty just simply carrying on a normal conversation. The person with lupus fog will lose things from time to time, but you're able to replay, retract your steps like finding those keys that are on the table. But the person with Alzheimer's disease, they repeatedly misplace things and they're unable to, re, uh, to retrace their steps and eventually find them. So what is your action plan? Number one, uh, the first question you should ask yourself is, should, should you see a neurologist? Neurologists are the experts when it comes to memory problems and, uh, and dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So who should see a, derma, uh, a neurologist? Number one, if you're over 60 years of age, it's a good idea. Um, it's not nearly as common in people who are in their 60s, but definitely in your 70s and 80s, Alzheimer's disease becomes much more prevalent. That's an important thing to make sure is not going on. If you have early dementia that runs in your family, then it's a good idea to see a neurologist because there are some degenerative brain disorders that do run in families that occur less than 60 years of age. If the memory greatly interferes with the quality of your life and your family keeps bugging you that you're forgetting things, it's a good idea to see a, a neurologist just to make sure that there is not something else going on and to get some expertise uh, help in that area. Make sure you see a neurologist, by the way, has a special interest in memory problems and dementia. There's a special type of uh, health care provider called a neuropsychologist that's especially helpful to use. And in our area, we're, we're very fortunate in that we have one of the world's experts in memory problems right here in our area, uh, Dr. Majid Fatuhi. He actually has offices uh, in Lutherville, Maryland, also in uh, Columbia, Maryland, and is ready to open up an office in uh, Chevy Chase. If anybody watches do the Dr. Oz show, you probably seen him on the Dr. Oz show actually talking about memory. And he, and on his website, he does uh, say that he takes most insurance plans and even Medicare, and the information on how to contact him and make an appointment uh, is in your handout. So first, what kind of things do we see that can cause memory problems in lupus? We can divide them up into two big groups. There's the irreversible causes that you have no control over, and then there's the causes that you can get some treatment for. So first, the irreversible things. These are things that you just can't do anything about. Number one is age. Of course, I wish I had a cure for aging, but I don't. And as we get older, memory does get worse over time. The second one is your genetics. You can't help what genes you were born with, and unfortunately some people do inherit genes that can cause uh, earlier memory problems uh, than in other people. Decreased kidney function. Uh, if your doctor has diagnosed you with chronic kidney disease, or if you have had lupus nephritis in the past, inflammation of the kidneys, and has caused some permanent kidney damage, that can unfortunately also be associated with decreased memory. If you've ever had a stroke, a stroke is basically a heart attack of the brain, and a part of the brain actually dies, and there's nothing you can do to recover that loss. CNS lupus, or what we call central nervous system lupus, where it can attack the brain or the spinal cord, unfortunately can cause some permanent problems with memory. And then concussions or traumatic brain injury can also cause permanent damage and cause difficulty with memory. But even though these are irreversible, you can still do things to improve your memory, even if you have these as the cause of your memory problems. And there's the, the treatable causes. Number one is depression. The studies on lupus patients and memory problems show over and over that, that depression is one of the top causes of memory problems. If you've been diagnosed with depression and it's not being treated adequately, you need to ask for more help. If you don't feel like your primary care provider is getting you adequate help, ask to see a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists are really the experts when it comes to treating depression. Unfortunately, depression is underdiagnosed and undertreated with systemic lupus. Studies uh, bear that out. And so I do encourage you, if you think that you may possibly have depression, actually put a depression self-test 
in the handout. Take that test, and if you score highly on the test, show it to your doctor and get some help for depression. Fibromyalgia occurs in 30 to 50% of people who have systemic lupus. It's a neurological problem where the, uh, nerve, uh, the pain nerves of the body are overactive, and it does cause problems with severe fatigue, memory problems, sleep problems, and it also does have uh, treatments available for fibromyalgia. The lack of exercise. In fact, I'll show you a study which shows that exercise is a big cause of memory problems in people who have systemic lupus. Unfortunately, there's very good treatments for it. You just got to get <laughs> off your butt and exercise. <laughs> Next are the things that can cause hardening of the arteries. These things such as high blood pressure, diabetes, being overweight, having high cholesterol, they can cause hardening of the arteries and cause decreased blood supply to parts of the brain, and all of these, of course, do have treatments. Anxiety disorder can cause memory problems. The lack of sleep. Most Americans do not get enough sleep, and that does cause difficulty with memory. 30% of people with lupus have something called antiphospholipid antibodies. These are antibodies that can actually cause tiny blood clots and cause difficulty with memory. If you're not sure if you're positive for these antibodies, just ask your rheumatologist because we do check them in almost all of our lupus patients. And if you're positive for them, you should consider taking a blood thinner such as baby aspirin, 81 milligrams a day. Or if you've had significant blood clots in the past, you should be on a stronger a blood, uh, blood thinner such as warfarin or coumadin. Medications can cause memory problems, and I'll tell you the ones you should not be taking. And then lastly, excessive drinking of alcohol. Unfortunately, high doses of alcohol can destroy parts of the brain and the nerves and cause permanent nerve damage, and people who have a history of alcoholism should just never drink alcohol again. So the medicines you should avoid if you have any memory problems at all, number one, never take Ambien. Sleep problems are very common in lupus, but Ambien actually makes memory problems uh, worse. Number two, uh, Benadryl is an antihistamine which can also cause memory problems. It's oftentimes also used for sleep, so you need to work on other ways to get good sleep instead of taking those two things. Anxiety disorders are very common in lupus, so a lot of people take Valium and Ativan very bad for memory problems as well. There's much better medicines these days to treat anxiety disorders. The last one is much more difficult. People who have pain, and 90% of our patients with lupus do have significant pain, need to take pain medicines. <coughs> Unfortunately, a lot of those pain medicines can also cause difficulties with memory. But also, pain can do the same thing, so it's much more difficult in the person who has pain and how to treat it and also not affect their memory at all. But the first few things should absolutely not be taken by people with memory problems. No Ambien, no Valium, no Ativan, and no, uh, and no Benadryl. Okay, next I'm going to talk about things that you can, uh, that you can do to actually improve uh, your memory or decrease the decline in your memory over time. And these are all based upon good research. The first list, just don't waste your money on these. These do not work. The, the good studies prove that they don't work, so don't take ginkgo biloba. Don't waste your money on multiple vitamins. Don't take omega-3 fatty acid supplements. Diet is good. Food for omega-3 fatty acids are excellent, but the supplements just do not work. And then lastly, don't use soy protein supplements for memory problems. Soy protein supplements, by the way, are a great source of protein, but it's not going to uh, really help your memory at all. This list shows things that probably don't work. There's some small studies which show that and may be helpful, but then other better studies uh, disprove that they help. So I, myself, I would not waste my money on these either. Antioxidant uh, vitamins such as vitamin E, vitamin uh, C, and beta carotene probably do not help. And then the B vitamins such as B6, B12, and folic acid. But there is one exception. In people who have pernicious anemia, which is an autoimmune disease where they can't absorb vitamin B12, if the B12 level is severely low and they have memory problems at that particular time, then taking B12 and raising the B12 level can absolutely be helpful. But in most people, no help at all. Next, I'd like everybody to look at this uh, Royal Flush cards. And I'd like you to m think of just one of these cards in your mind. Don't tell your, the person sitting next to you, but just think of one of them. And I'm going to make your card disappear. Did I make it disappear? <laughs> the reason I did that is that the studies show that by this time in the talk, two-thirds of you are not paying attention to me. <laughs> 
you're thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight, or you know, who's coming to the house tomorrow. Oh, I was going to do something today. I need to think about that thing to do today. So I want to catch your attention because the next things I'm going to talk about are absolutely important in helping out with memory. So first, these things have been shown to be helpful for a decreasing memory decline over time. Number one is a, is a diet high in vegetables. Uh, there was a very nice study on Japanese Americans where they looked at oh, close to 2,000 Japanese Americans, and those who had a high vegetable diet had significantly less dementia and memory problems compared to those who did not. Next are omega-3 fatty acid-rich foods. Again, the supplements do not work, but the studies on diet-rich in omega-3 fatty acids show a decreased decline uh, with memory and dementia over time. Things to think about incorporating in your diet are, are fishes from uh, cold water that are fatty, such as salmon and mackerel. Walnuts is, are very high in omega-3 fatty acids. In fact, a study from Harvard just last year showed that people who ate a handful of nuts every day live longer than those who do not. So buy big bags of walnuts from Costco and Walmart and just have a, a handful every day. I like to incorporate flaxseed into my diet. Flaxseed, by the way, has the highest concentration of omega-3 fatty acids of any other food. And what I do is I have one to three protein shakes every day, and I just grind up some flaxseed and add it to my protein shake. If you go to YouTube.com and just Google my name, Donald Thomas, and lupus protein shake, you'll see how I make my shake with uh, flax seeds in it. So it's a very good, healthy way to incorporate those omega-3 fatty acids in your diet every day. Next, the Mediterranean diet. More and more primary care physicians are recommending the Mediterranean diet as a healthy diet in their patients. And the studies with memory and dementia show that those who incorporate a Mediterranean diet have less dementia and memory problems over time. And wouldn't this be a nice place to be sitting at right now? <laughs> yeah. So what is the Mediterranean diet? If you don't know how to do it, there's, a, there's books out there now, like even uh, Mediterranean Diet for Dummies is out there. It's a very good book. But this is basically what it is. The pyramid at the, bo the bottom part are things that you should eat every single day. Whole grains, and not the simple semolina pasta or the white bread, but things that actually have whole grains in them on a daily basis should be a main part of your diet. Lots of fruits and vegetables, legumes, nuts, um, also incorporating a little bit of olive oil every day. In fact, there was a study, by the way, where one and a half tablespoons of olive oil a day in patients with lupus actually decreased lupus disease activity. So get a little bit of olive oil in your uh, diet every day. And then a little bit of cheese and yogurt as well. A few days a week you should be getting in some type of fish or poultry, a little bit of eggs. And you notice what's at the top of the, of the pyramid, red meats. Only have red meats about one to four times a month, and that's it, because they are not good for your memory. And then notice on the left, wine in moderation can actually be very helpful uh, for your memory. Next, the, the Nurses Health Study is a huge study that follows nurses over time. And in, and in this particular study, it showed that nurses who incorporate uh, daily servings of uh, fruits that are high in flavonoids actually decrease the onset of dementia. And these include things such as strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries. By the way, dark chocolate is very high in flavonoids. So this woman asked her doctor, can you prescribe for me some chocolate mini nuts? And he said it's true that, that the flavonoids in chocolate can help reduce platelet activation and influence the balance of icosanoids, but that is not a justification for me to prescribe for you those chocolate mini eggs. <laughs> One thing about chocolate, though, is that you notice that in dark chocolate, how bitter it is. It's the bitterness that actually contains those antioxidants and flavonoids. The milk chocolate, like Reese's Cups, those are not high in antioxidants. <laughs> it's only the dark chocolate, and it should be just a small amount on a regular basis, but it can be very healthy for you. Next, we'll talk about alcohol. Too much alcohol absolutely is bad for the brain, nerves, liver, etc. But a small amount of alcohol on a regular basis can actually be healthy and good for you. And in fact, the studies on memory and dementia show that people who drink a small amount of alcohol actually have less dementia over time compared to those who don't. Before you start to drink alcohol in your diet, though, please discuss it with your doctor. You need to make sure you have no liver problems and that you're not on any medications which can cause problems with alcohol. In addition, if you have a strong family history of alcoholism or if you've had a history of alcohol excess yourself, please don't incorporate alcohol into your own diet. 
So I run into this problem a lot where people's ideas of a serving is very different than what my idea of a serving is. One of my patients told me he drank one serving of uh, vodka a day. His serving of a vodka, by the way, was a whole fifth of vodka. Because <laughs> his liver function test kept being high all, every time I'd see him, and finally he confessed that that's what his serving size was. But these are the definitions of a proper serving size of alcohol. These are the healthy amounts of alcohol. This is for women and also for men over the age of 65 years old. One ounce of liquor or five ounces of wine or 12 ounces of beer. And by the way, the restaurant idea of, of wine serving is way too much. Uh, you should only drink five ounces. And also, it's a, it's a, there's a time limit. If you chug a shot or you chug a 12-ounce beer in you know, a few seconds, that's very, very unhealthy because alcohol levels go up too quickly in the blood. It's actually dangerous for you. If you want to do this over a, an hour or two period, like with dinner or something like that. Men less than 65 years of age uh, can have up to two servings, but women should be one serving or less. Now we're talking about, um, the reason for that is that it, that it is toxic above that level. You have to think about the toxicity. Alcohol is like any drug, by the way. There's levels that are toxic and dangerous, and there's levels that can be healthy for you. So it's really important to remember that. Now we're talking about two things that absolutely are beneficial for memory problems. The first is exercise. Every single study looking at exercise and memory shows significant improvements in memory in people who exercise regularly. Also, decreased rates of Alzheimer's disease and significant dementia. This uh, particular pyramid of physical exercise and activity is being used more and more by primary physicians to show people how much exercise they should do. At the very bottom are things that you should do on a, on a daily, everyday basis. And these are things such as just getting out and doing things. Instead of parking in that first parking spot right next to the doorway, park at the end of the parking lot. Take those extra steps and make yourself do some more activity. Don't take the elevator. Go up and down the stairs if you're physically able to do so. Walk the dog a little bit farther than, than you normally do. Those are the things you should work on doing every day, and they're so easy to do. The next part of the, the pyramid are things that you should do three to five days a week. This does include things such as aerobic exercise, like getting on the elliptical machine, doing the treadmill, dancing, uh, slow jogging if you're physically able to do so. The next rung are things that you should do two to three days a week. This includes flexibility exercises and strengthening exercises, building up your muscle mass, which actually helps to use up calories uh, more than if you don't have as much muscle. Then notice what's at the very top of the pyramid this is a person watching TV and sitting at the computer. These things are things that you should stop doing or do much less of. Try to do all the things at the bottom of the pyramid instead. Dr. Fatui, that expert in memory, he says that the best exercise for memory is dancing. And the reason for that is that you're cross-training different parts of the brain. And the way this works is that, number one, you're having to use, um, you're having to memorize steps, and so that uses one part of the brain. You're also having to balance yourself, that uses a different part of the brain. You're listening to music, and you're trying to coordinate your movements with the music, that uses a different part of the brain. And then dancing also helps to improve mood, it also helps with sleep, and it also helps to decrease stress. So if you're trying to think of some good exercise, going to those Zumba classes and other things are actually very good for your memory, in addition, in addition for your cardiovascular health. This was a nice study done at the University of Illinois. Uh, Dr. Hillman is actually an expert in memory problems and exercise. He took 20 children, and he had them sit, and he put uh, EEG uh, probes on their scalp, and had them do memory tests. After 20 minutes of sitting, he did uh, their EEG and did what's called a neuroscan, and got the scan of the brain on the left with inactivity. Then he had them get on a treadmill and walk until their, their heart rate got to 60% of their maximum heart rate, and then he had them sit down, and when their heart rate got back to close to its baseline, he did the EEG neuroscan again and gave them the memory test, and this is what their brain looked like after exercising. Significant increased uh, activity within the brain because of the increased blood flow that they're getting from the exercise. So not only are we getting it, seeing this improvement in studies, we're actually seeing it on brain scans as well, so it's very important to incorporate exercise into your lifestyle. When I recommend to my patients that they exercise, the most common comeback is, Doc, I'm too busy to exercise. 
So I love this cartoon. I have it up in every single one of my exam rooms. My patients who are here today, they, they know this. But the, the doctor says back to this patient, so what fits into your uh, busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? <laughs> too much of us are doing too many things in our daily life that are not important. We need to learn how to prioritize things. Exercise is an important part of living, and if with having systemic lupus, if you exercise a little bit every day, you're going to do much better in the long run for many different reasons. Sometimes I'm too busy as a physician. I mean, I come home after a 12-hour day of work, and it's very easy for me to lay down on the couch and say, I'm just too busy, I'm just too tired, I just don't want to exercise. One thing I've incorporated into my lifestyle is something called the seven-minute high-intensity interval training. There was a nice research study that showed that doing just seven minutes of these exercises is as effective, if not even more effective, than much longer amounts of aerobic exercise and uh, muscle strengthening exercises. Basically, you do each exercise only 20 seconds, and then you rest for 20 seconds. So you do jumping jacks for 20 seconds, rest for 20 sec or 10 seconds, do push-ups for 20 seconds, rest for 10 seconds, and by the time you're done with all the exercises, seven minutes is gone. And uh, what I do is I downloaded a free app on my smartphone. If you just uh, do an app search for HIIT, which stands for High Interval, uh, High Intensity Interval Training, you can download this app and then just plug in the, the names of the exercises and the time limits, and then it actually talks to you and tells you what exercises to do, and I found that to be very helpful. So everyone can do seven minutes of exercise. And by the way, if you have bad arthritis and you can't do some of these things, such as the push-ups, or, or if your balance is bad and you can't step up on a chair, you can substitute a similar type of exercise. It doesn't have to be exactly these. So there was a study a few years ago where they took 138 women who had systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, this is an example of one who had bad memory problems. She's doing all the things that we recommend not doing. She's smoking cigarettes. She's playing games on her computer. She has. She does have the alcohol there, but you see the other empty alcohol bottle there? She's had more than her one limit for the day of alcohol. And then instead of those vegetables and omega-3 fatty acids, she's eating too many potato chips. But they looked at the ones who exercised versus those that didn't and looked at their weight as well. And what the study showed is that in those who don't exercise, 23% of them had significant memory impairment. When they looked at weight, those who had, were overweight, 23% of them had significant memory impairment. So then they looked at the ones who exercised regularly and that had normal weight. But those who exercised regularly, only 5% had significant problems with their memory. So in those who don't exercise and those who are overweight, they had four to five times the prevalence of memory problems compared to those who don't exercise. I cannot overemphasize how important exercise is to improve memory. Remember those treatable causes of things that can cause memory problems in lupus? This is that same slide, but in red I put those things where exercise is one of the most important parts of treatment. In fact, with depression, regular exercise is just as effective as Prozac for treating depression. Um, for uh, uh, fibromyalgia, it's important. And of course, for lack of the, the lack of exercise part, of course, exercise is the treatment of choice. The next thing that definitely helps in study after study is exercising your brain. So not only should you be exercising your body, but you should be exercising your brain on a daily basis to help with your memory. The important thing to remember is you need to push your brain out of its comfort zone. Don't do the things that you always do, but make parts of your brain do work that normally do not work. What I like to use is, an one, and I actually do this myself every day, it's called Lumosity.com. You might have heard of, of it on the commercials. This is actually developed by neuroscientists. They have over 30 exercises that, that incorporate different parts of memory and concentration uh, and speed and other things to help improve people's memory. And what you do is when you first sign up for this, it's only like $10 a month, it gives you a bunch of these tests and it figures out what you're good at and what you're bad at. And this is just one example of a man who's in his late 30s and he uh, was in the 56th percentile compared to all, everyone in his age group, which means he was about average for memory. But then it breaks it down into speed, memory, attention, flexibility, and problem solving. And you can see that with this gentleman 
he was better than 87% of people in his age group for memory uh, for problem solving, but not very good with speed or memory or attention. So what Lumosity will do is it will actually give him exercises to do every day that will actually focus on his deficiencies. It will actually make him do exercises that work on the speed, that work on the memory. When I did this myself, I did great with memory. I did great with problem solving. I, I think that you'd want a doctor who's good at memory and problem solving. But I was not very good at speed. My attention was horrible. Like one of my one of my downfalls is that I'm horrible with names and faces. I know some of you can probably relate, but that's my my that's my attention problem. So one of the games that this uh, Lumosity has me do every day is is a name and face game where I'm a waiter and I have to take people's uh, orders and I have to remember their name and I have to remember their face and I have to remember it every time I do the game over and over. And the interesting thing is that now I find myself when I meet someone, I really concentrate on learning their name and I, and I am doing much better over time with that. So it does make you learn things and work parts of your brain that you normally don't use. The other nice thing is that it gives you a score called the BPI initially that shows you what your memory is like. And this, this BPI is just uh, for lumosity. It really doesn't mean anything scientifically. But what it is is a number that shows how good you are at speed and memory and all these things added up. But the nice thing is that if you do these exercises regularly every day, you can actually see yourself improve over time. And it's really nice and gives you some positive reinforcement in that you know people with memory, they, you feel so bad about it but this can give you some positive reinforcement knowing that you're improving over time. So I highly recommend this program. But it's not the only one out there. There's three other ones that are commonly used. At the, uh, the Walter Reed, where I go to teach sometimes, they have a very good traumatic brain um, uh, center. And they actually use all four of the all four of these in their soldiers who have traumatic brain injury. And they're showing in very nice research studies that they're getting significant improvements in their memory, headaches, sleep problems simply by doing these brain games on a regular basis. And they're getting very good feedback from the soldiers, by the way. The soldiers actually love going to the lab and doing these because it's a fun thing to do. Lumosity, I just take 10 to 15 minutes a day, and it's a lot of fun to do just five games a day and, and improve over time. If you don't have a computer and if you don't have the internet, don't fret because there's other things that you can do. Remember, you need to force yourself to do things you're not used to. Everybody thinks about doing crossword puzzles. Oops. <coughs> um, so, uh, don't, but if you're good at words, don't do crossword puzzles, because you're already good at that. Instead, force yourself to do math problems with Sudoku. If you're really good at math, don't do Sudoku. Force yourself to do the, the, uh, the crossword puzzles. Get yourself a big uh, a puzzle book, and those puzzles that you don't think you can do, force yourself to do those things that are uncomfortable, and that's going to help your memory over time. This is one thing that Dr. Fatuhi recommends doing. It's called, um, uh, it's called writing, um, uh, uh, mirror writing. And what you do is, is this lady is right-handed, and she's writing out John 3.16 with her right hand, and at the exact same time with her left hand, she's writing John 3.16 in a mirror image. And this is uh, quite complicated what she's doing, but it's very easy to do this yourself. Just sit down with a pen in each hand, do this every single day, and with your right hand or your dominant hand, print your name, and at the exact same time, do the same with your other hand backwards so that they mirror each other. And what that does is it forces other parts of your brain to work that normally are not working. And again, this is recommended by Dr. Fatuhi. But there's other things you can do too. For example, learn just practice writing with your opposite hand like for a minute every day. Um, when you're eating, don't eat with your right hand. If you eat with your right hand, usually eat with your left hand because it's going to force other parts of your brain to work. These are very simple brain exercise that you can do on a daily basis. This is Dr. Fatuhi's book. If you don't get a chance to see him personally in the office, consider getting his book. It's very highly regarded and has a, and, uh, it, it goes over a lot of the tricks that he recommends for people improving uh, their, uh, their memory. It's called Boost Your Brain. Think you can't be fooled? You just were. Read it again. I was fooled. I did not see the two U's. Did anybody else not see the two U's? Think you, you can't be fooled. It's amazing how our brains can make us think or see things that we don't see 
and sometimes don't see what we're actually seeing. So the brain is a very powerful uh, thing. And this just brings to my next step. There's things that you can do on a daily basis to practice improving your memory. One of them is concentrating. Most of us just read this very quickly. We really were not concentrating on what we were reading. But look how simple it is with the two U's on there. This comes to the thing of multitasking. Multitasking is bad. Every research study looking at multitaskers show that multitaskers are not as good at multitasking as they really think they are. When you multitask, you, you are absolutely going to do poorly on something that you're working on. So when you're we're on the computer looking at your email and someone calls you on the phone, stop doing your email. Stop looking at the computer. Concentrate on talking to that person or you're going to, ignore, you're going to miss a lot of the important stuff that they're telling you. If you're at work and you're on your computer, Jess, and someone comes up to you and talks to you, stop working on the computer and focus your attention completely on that person so you can listen to and remember everything that they tell you. So stop multitasking and learn to concentrate. It's really an important skill to learn. Number two is learn to use different types of, sen uh, of sensory inputs. When someone introduces themselves to you, uh, you're just hearing that person and you're seeing their face, but get in the habit of repeating their name. Hi, Judy, how are you doing? It's very nice to meet you. So, Judy, what do you do for, a, for, a, for fun in your daily life? Well, Judy, it was really nice to meet you. And if you have a pen and paper, write down that person's name. If you do those kind of things by saying things out loud and writing them down, you're going to remember them better. People who have memory problems should get in the habit of carrying around paper and pen and learn to write things down. Just don't think you're going to remember everything, but get in the habit of writing things down instead. Also learn to get organized. It doesn't have to be complicated. This is uh, what one woman on the internet likes to do. She's a mother and she puts this up on her refrigerator to do every day. By the way, people with memory problems should not have a big uh, to-do list. For your today's goals or to do today, just have one important thing to get done that day. Don't overburden yourself with too many things. But again, learn to prioritize. Only do those things that you have to do. There's a lot of things that we do that we would like to do that are not really that important. And then look at her daily list. She does include exercise on her daily activities, and it should be on yours as well. Stress causes significant memory problems. In fact, stress actually makes lupus disease activity worse, and it's such an important thing to learn how to reduce stress. In your handout, I, I give you a lot of tips on how to reduce stress in your life. A very important word to remember as a lupus patient is no. When someone asks you to watch your grandkids and you have a lot of other things to do, learn to say no. It's important to prioritize those things in your life. Put your health first, put yourself first, put your family right up there. But a lot of the things that you do in your daily life are probably not that important. If you're finding other excuses to not exercise, then you need to work on your priorities. A lot of my patients come to me saying, I'm having trouble remembering things and I'm so tired. The first thing I ask them is, well, what time do you go to bed at night and what time do you get up in the morning? Most Americans do not get enough sleep. Usually they tell me, oh, I go to bed at 11 and I get up at 5. So how are you not supposed to be tired and have trouble with memory if you only get 6 hours of sleep every night? Studies show that most Americans do not get enough sleep. It's really important to work on getting at least 8 hours of sleep every night. If you're not and you have excuses on why you're not getting 8 hours, you need to figure out you know, what things to prioritize uh, in your life. There's also a lot of things that sabotage our sleep at night and make our quality of sleep bad. And it's such as drinking alcohol at nighttime or exercising too close to bedtime, drinking caffeine, smoking cigarettes with that uh, nicotine. So there's a lot of things you can do to improve the quality of your sleep. And that uh, I put in the handout some important recommendations on how to improve your sleep quality as well in order to help out with your memory. <laughs> Two weeks ago, we had our DC walk to end lupus. Many of you were there. I, I recognize a lot of faces in the audience. Nick Cannon was our Grand Marshal. You, along with 5,000 other people with systemic lupus and their supporters, their friends, and their loved ones, we walked down Pennsylvania Avenue towards the Capitol building, and then we walked back, and we were united to fight against lupus, and we raised close to a quarter of a million dollars oh, wow. to fight against lupus. Thanks to Jessica and everybody else who did that. 
So I hope that some of you will consider coming to our walk next year. It's really an amazing event. This is our great finish line and our start line. At the finish line, you can see the beautiful Capitol building in the background. This also makes me, reminds me that this is the end of my lecture also, which I'm glad, I'm sure that you're happy uh, to know about. I just want you to know that there's absolutely things that you can do to improve your memory and to decrease the decline of memory over time. Please make exercise a part of your lifestyle. The seven minute workout is very easy to do. You can always have, to have time for seven minutes. Dancing has been shown to be one of the best exercises to do for memory as well, and it's a lot of fun, so get into those Zumba classes and other types of dance classes. Train your brain. Uh, Lumosity.com is really good, but you don't need to have that. You can uh, force yourself to do things with your non-dominant hand every day, uh, write with your non-dominant hand, do puzzles on a regular basis to help as well. Also make those lifestyle changes such as eating a Mediterranean-based diet, eating omega-3 fatty acids every day such as fish, walnuts, flaxseed in your diet, very easy to do, wine in moderation, but check with your doctor first please before you do that. Please do what this slide says. If you're sitting here because you're not happy with your memory, follow the algorithm and you should be doing what's in the middle, change something. If you Don't just sit there and listen to me and say, oh, those are, sound like great advice, Dr. Thomas. I should be exercising. I should be eating better. Instead, make this the first day of the rest of your life and start to incorporate this, uh, these activities into your lifestyle every day. Lupus is an invisible disease. Lupus is a cruel disease. Lupus does cause lupus fog. Lupus does cause cognitive dysfunction. But there's something you can do about it, and you have the information right here. So I challenge each and every one of you to don't let lupus control you, but learn to control lupus. Thank you. So the first, and, and by the way, um, uh, out in the lobby, I'll be sitting there all day answering questions also. So if you want to come up to ask any uh, more personal questions, I'll be glad to answer them. All I ask is like, you ever, you ever see Lucy in the Peanuts cartoon where she says the doc is in and she gives psychiatric advice? Well, I'm giving uh, uh, lupus advice, and, uh, but back then it was five cents, but inflation has occurred, so I'm asking for a dollar or more. And all the proceeds go to the Lupus Foundation, by the way. <laughs> But these questions are free, by the way. So what do you recommend that people um, of, of lower socioeconomic status do for proper nutrition and exercise if it is normally out of their means of control or on a budget? And that is a very difficult uh, problem. In fact, I know Washington, D.C. is currently running a, a, a program where they're trying to get good food and good groceries in areas of the city that are underserved because unfortunately a lot of our uh, areas of the city don't have grocery stores that have good healthy food in them. Um, but one thing about healthy food is that actually a lot of healthy food is a lot cheaper than a lot of the bad food. It's very easy for us to fall into the habit of going to McDonald's and getting the 99 cent uh, menu. And, and by the way, that's one of the big reasons why people of lower socioeconomic status are oftentimes have such a worse obesity problem because it's so much easier to go for the cheap bad food. But the vegetable aisle and the fruit aisle, or if you go to Costco or places like that, you can get big bags of really healthy frozen vegetables and fruit for a good price. It does take a lot of a lot of work to learn how to, to cook healthy. I, I do know that it is that it can be quite inexpensive to learn to cook healthy. I'm not an expert at it. I wish I was, but I know that these things can be learned. Uh, you get the book called um, uh, called Mediterranean Diet for Dummies. It has a lot of good advice in there on things that you can do to help improve your diet for uh, for inexpensive amounts. Also, exercise is very inexpensive. <laughs> You don't have to go to a gym to exercise regularly. In fact, there's a lot of programs that show uh, even uh, good exercise programs for people who have bad arthritis as well. So you don't have to have money to exercise at all. And then lastly, as far as the, the brain games, I know that the, the internet is certainly out of the, the realm of a lot of people who don't have the money. But puzzle books are very inexpensive. Learning to force to do things with your non-dominant hand is very inexpensive. 
dancing to TV shows, or uh, there's a lot of exercise programs on TV where you can learn to dance. Those are inexpensive too. So it's difficult, but it can be done. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much. Very good. Yes, and in fact, there's a lot of different types of puzzle books out there, and I, I definitely believe the word searches are very good to, to look and look for those uh, different words, and it's a very good type of exercise. Thank you. So next, uh, why do doctors, if they know your illnesses, suggest medications they know will affect other problems you're having? such as you've been prescribed Tramadol for hip pain, but you've also been told the doctor about your memory problems. That's a good question. And in fact, that's what I was trying to allude to with that one particular slide. A problem with pain is that pain greatly affects the quality of life of people. In fact, hip arthritis is one of the hardest arthritis to treat. And the problem with pain is that pain greatly affects sleep at night and also causes great difficulty with memory. So as the physician, we have quite this quandary of how do we help this person out with their severe pain but not hurt other things that are going on. So it's a, it's a, it's a very delicate balancing act. But I will have to tell you that pain is the number one complaint and problem in people who have systemic lupus erythematosus and most people will come out and say that it's the number one thing that gives them a poor quality of life so I have, and, and a lot of our patients by the way with lupus they do have chronic kidney disease or kidney problems or high blood pressure so most of the pain medicines such as ibuprofen, naproxen, meloxicam, uh, peroxicam we cannot use in people who have lupus because of their kidney problems and high blood pressure and other things Tramadol is actually one of the safest pain medicines that we have, so it can help out with the pain, and even though it can help, it can also decrease memory, I'm left trying to think, well, this person's pain is the worst thing going on with them, so I'm stuck with doing that. We really do need better pain medicines these days. The pain medicine choices are not very good, and unfortunately we have a small armamentarium uh, to work with. I wish we had better answers. Uh, next is I meant, um, oh, okay, I... Uh, Okay, I not only have lupus, but I also have attention deficit disorder. I would like to know uh, where cognitive issues uh, stop with the lupus and attention deficit disorder takes over. And this also comes to my slide about disorders that cause <coughs> memory problems in people who have lupus. When I get a lupus patient who has memory problems, very rarely can I say, your memory problem is because of this your memory problem is because of that. It's usually a combination of things. So it's usually a combination of things like depression, anxiety disorder, attention deficit disorder, lack of exercise. So it's not just one thing or another. Uh, this issue actually uh, rings true for me. I have a patient who has systemic lupus and Sjogren's syndrome who has horrible attention deficit disorder. He actually works at the NASA uh, space Center and is a high functioning engineer, but his memory has gotten so horrible because of the uh, attention deficit disorder that he's having to work, uh, he's having to go into disability. There's things he can do to improve his memory, but unfortunately, the ABD uh, makes it much more difficult for him. And it's really even above what I can do for him, really, his psychiatrist is the one who needs to give him the help and hopefully help his memory in the long run. So there's usually a very fine line in, uh, as far as what is causing uh, particular memory problems in any one particular lupus patient. And any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. You mentioned something about not doing the fish oils. Why is that? Yes. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yes. Um, uh, uh, someone asked that I recommended not taking fish oil, and I absolutely stand behind that. And this is actually... Uh, Dr. Michelle Petrie, who's one of the world's experts in lupus, she started saying this a few years ago, and she's absolutely correct. Everything, every single research study looking at fish oil capsules, omega-3 fatty acid supplements, etc., the good studies, you have to ignore the bad studies. There's a lot of bad studies that show positive results, but they're just not good studies. But the large studies that are very well done, they show no benefit for many health problems. And, uh, and that is the truth. And, and there's a lot of potential reasons for that, is that number one, 
the, all, there's a, the studies on omega-3 fatty acids like fish um, and diet, they all have positive benefits. There must be other things in these foods that are giving us healthy benefits instead of just the things that we think are helpful and that we're taking out. Because we're taking out the other vitamins and minerals and the other probably healthy things that are in the foods. Number two, what, what's happening to these things when we manufacture them and manipulate them in the factories? Number three, the FDA has absolutely no um, oversight over supplements and vitamins. In fact, a lot of studies have been done where they've looked at over-the-counter supplements and vitamins like fish oil, and, they sh and all of them show the same thing, that 80% of over-the-counter supplements have, don't even have in them what they say they have in them, or it's a very uh, low supply of what they have in them. And so, so I, just from the medical research side, I have to say that the supplements are not good. It's much better to eat the salmon, eat the mackerel, eat some walnuts, get the flax seed. That's where the money's at. Thank you. That's a very good question. And by the way, if you read, uh, I'll get to you in a second, but if you read the book by Dr. Matugi, uh, by the way, um, he actually recommends taking supplements that have DHA. I have to completely disagree. Um, I read the research, and we have a program called UpToDate.com that I use all the time. And the memory experts in there actually show the studies that dispute taking the supplements that have omega-3 fatty acids. So I have to, uh, Dr. Matugi is very good in almost everything else in the book, but that's the one thing I have to disagree with. Uh, so eat that fish and eat the walnuts and flaxseed instead. Yes, sir? Why is the pathogenesis of lupus related memory impairment? Um, it's, <laughs> doctors love the, oh, I'm sorry. He asked, what's the pathogenesis of the reasons that patients with systemic lupus erythematosus have problems with memory? Pathogenesis means um, what is actually going on medically and scientifically and uh, biologically to ca cause the actual abnormality. It's, it, as physicians, we love to use a word called multifactorial, <laughs> meaning that there's a lot, a lot of different reasons. Um, and it's not just one reason that people with lupus have memory problems, but it's usually due to a combination of things such as not exercising regularly, having depression, having fibromyalgia. But also there's probably problems going on with the brain. There's immune um, inflammatory problems, like there's uh, problems with cytokines, which are, are an important part of the immune system that actually can cause inflammation in the brain and cause problems with memory. There's a lot of research being done right now for central uh, central nervous system involvement from lupus. We don't have all the answers, but all the things that can cause memory problems are in that list that I gave you, the ones that we can help and the ones that we really don't have any treatments for. But multifactorial is the answer. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, and I think we're going to have lunch, or do you have something to say? should give yourself a plug too. He, um, Dr. Thomas has a great Facebook page, um, the Lupus Encyclopedia. Um, and is your book out? Uh, June the 5th. Yes, and June 5th, uh, Dr. Thomas has a book coming out called the Lupus Encyclopedia. So I encourage you to follow that and definitely follow his Facebook page because I learn something every day, I think. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we are going to break for lunch. So in your folder, you should have a list of nearby restaurants or places you can eat.